Mexican sea that she loved so much and called it Beauvoir, knew that this would be the last home for her and but her beloved husband. In 1859, Sarah Dorsey was overseas and that's when she first met Henry Watkins Allen. Now, they ended up teaming up together in 1866 to make the memoirs of Henry Allen. That book talked about what it was like for Henry Allen to be the governor of Louisiana during the war between the states. So when she found out that Jefferson Davis was in southern Mississippi in 1870s trying to find some land to clear, she was very curious to find out why. When she found out he was looking for a beautiful view and somewhere where he could write his memoirs, and found out that those memoirs was gonna be about the rise and fall of the Confederate government, she naturally thought this would be the perfect spot for him to write that book, and she was more than happy to help him. She invited him here, and he officially started writing the book in 1877, The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. She originally didn't want him to clear land, and also didn't want him to have to pay rent, and that's when Davis made it very clear. Ma'am, I've been a president, a general, a senator, and a congressman. I earn my keep, I pay my way. I don't want things handed to me. I insist that I pay rent. They came to the agreement of $50 a month. And when Davis's family came over, he even shipped in more. They started. Now, during the writing of the rise and fall of the Confederate government, she had President Davis stay inside Brown's office, which was originally the schoolhouse for Mr. Brown's children between 1848 and 1866. They start writing the book, The Rise and Fall. She was acting as his secretary. Now, it was uh, the next time that they had a conversation actually involving the house was February 19th, 1879. That's when she came up to the president and said, Mr. President, I would like you to purchase both wall from me. I have over 670 acres, and I would like you to buy it for $5,500. Now, if you're anything like me, you're doing the math. She's been here seven years, loses 10 acres, and wants $2,000 more than what she paid for just a few years earlier. Well, the reason why is that shortly after purchasing Beauvoir, she sold 10 acres directly behind the mansion itself. That 10 acres connected Mobile and New Orleans on this side of the back bay. Not only did she add the rail line for the commerce, she also said since you cut my property in half, I would like a train station. 
and that was when they made her the Beauvoir train station. The train switch was actually in Mobile. This allowed the president to be able to transport and move around quickly from down south. Now she has her own train stop in Biloxi, Mississippi, where she had mass transportation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Memphis, Tennessee. Well worth the $2,000. She said, I want you to buy the property, Mr. President. That's when he said, ma'am, I can't. For the book is not finished yet and it won't be until 1881. And the fact that his oldest daughter, Margaret, married Joel Addison Hayes, January 1st, 1876. Now, they did not have a lot of money. They struggled after the war. But if Jefferson Davis did not give a presidential wedding with a presidential gift for his daughter, it would have been embarrassing for the ex-president. So they scraped together what they had and gave her furniture that was fit for that president's daughter and that wedding fit for her. The funny thing is, is that uh, it was the fact that Margaret and Joel actually moved from Memphis and they're staying in a boarding house in Louisiana. That boarding house would not even let the furniture go in the front door. The furniture was brought to Beauvoir, moved into the Circuit Methodist Minister's Cottage, and that's where it's even known today as the Hayes Cottage for the building that housed that incredible furniture. She says, I want you to buy it, Mr. President. And I know times are tough right now, so this is what we'll do. We'll do $5,500, five years and three payments. Your first payment won't even be needed until January 1st, 1880 of $1,000. All she wants the president and his family to move in is a signature from Jefferson, a signature from Marina, and a check of $1,000 postdated for January 1st, 1880. Well, who could ref refuse this deal? And the president did not. They moved in. Sarah moves to New Orleans. Fortunately, that same year, July 4th, 1879, God upon, called her upon his golden gates. She died early that morning. It wasn't until people opened up her will when they could see the true brilliancy of Sarah Ann Ellis Dorsey. She already willed her property, plantations, and monies to Jefferson Davis and family starting January 4th, 1878 a year and a month before they even bought the property. Now you see, Sarah doesn't have any children of her own. She has several half brothers and sisters. She's actually living here with her half-brother, Mortimer Dahlgren. Mortimer Dahlgren is actually a practicing lawyer. Coincidentally, in the same law firm as General Joseph Davis, Jefferson Davis' oldest brother's son. Now, he wanted to have the property, obviously, but Sarah actually wrote, I've done all for you that I can in life. I will not do more in death. She did not want to give the property to her family she wanted to give it to Jefferson Davis and family, people that she respected and admired very much. Now, the reason why she actually had them sign the papers, February 19, 1879, was to actually physically remove Beauvoir, summer home, from an ongoing contestable will situation. When she did that, she actually transferred it to a two-party contract. Now, you see, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, after the war, are no longer U.S. citizens. They cannot own property or vote until 1977 and 1978 when Jimmy Carter restored their citizenship. So she had to think about how she wrote it out. When she transferred that property from a negotiable item or a willable item to a two-party contract, that allowed Jefferson Davis to have his name on a contract saying that he is buying property and no one can say anything about it because she was smart enough to add Marina's name right next to it. Now, that is when Mortimer said, okay, sis, smart one, he got the house. Now that's the Davises, but we're not gonna let him have the family plantations. He sues Davis 
for those plantations and loses. Because once again, Sarah was above her time and above everyone else. She actually wrote on January 4th, 1878, that if anything happened to her, the property should be transferred to Jefferson Davis and family. Now, if anything happened to Jefferson Davis, it would be transferred over to his youngest daughter, Verena Ann. Verena Ann is still a U.S. citizen and can legally own property. Now, if that wasn't enough of the brilliancy, her true heart shows out in 1877. She has a Christmas party for Jefferson Davis. Generals from all around are coming to help Davis write his book and take with notes. That was when General Gilbert Early himself was here. Sarah pulls him aside, and that's when they had the conversation. He said, I didn't know if you knew this, but the family and Davis, they're not doing well right now. That's when she let him know, yes, she knew this. And that's when she let him in on the biggest secret of her life. She was dying of cancer, and she was going to give it all to the president and his family as her undevoted and undying wish to help him and the family. Many guests ask me, who is your favorite person that ever lived here? And my answer is flat out, Sarah Ann Ellis Dorsey. Where do you even start with the admiration for someone that was groundbreaking in almost everything she ever did? After the death of her father at nine, her new stepfather, when her mother married, saw the potential in her. Not only taught her bookkeeping, but also taught her a lot about law. She did so many things on her own, but she was never really on her own. She had a great support and a great loving stepdad and mom. With Sarah, it's hard not to fall in love with her, with being how smart she was, with being how quick-witted. She was everything that you would want a young lady nowadays to be. Unstoppable, had unstoppable courage, belief, and, uh, if you ever know someone with cancer and you know how strong they are, she's a beacon of hope for you. She did more when she was suffering at her greatest than most people do in a lifetime. She made everything that she had go to someone she respected. And she went against some of her own family members to stand for what she believed in, much like the Confederates did war between the states. She believed in what she believed in, and that's why I believe in her. She, uh, her writing, her music, her dance, her laugh, her love, her knowledge, she is an inspiration for us all, even to today. My wife, after I married her, went through three bouts, four different times, two different stages of cancer. why she means something to me and I think that's why she means something to everyone I cannot be more honored to represent and talk about her life for wonderful people that remember her as well as I do Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was a congressman, a two-time Mississippi State Senator. He was also the Secretary of War. Jefferson Davis was a graduate of West Point. He graduated with a degree in engineering. That degree served him well when he was in Washington. He helped design some of the viaducts and aqueducts because there was no running water. Some of those are still working today. He was in charge of the ex expansion of the House of Representatives and the House of Congress. Now, Beauvoir was many things in its history. It was a home to Mr. Brown and his wife and their 13 children. It was like a writer's retreat for Sarah Dorsey and then a retirement home for Jefferson Davis. It was also a Confederate veterans home from 1903 to 1957. 
We have 784 graves in our cemetery. Out of that 784, there are only four people buried there here who did not live here when it was a Confederate veterans home. We have two relatives of Miss Farina, Jefferson Davis's wife. We have Jefferson Davis's father. Jefferson Davis's father was buried on a family plantation in North Mississippi, but the river was changing its course. So the DAR, which is the Daughters of the American Revolution, brought Jefferson Davis's father here in 1943. One of the reasons the DAR brought Jefferson Davis's father here is because he was actually a Revolutionary War soldier. Then we have the tomb of our unknown Confederate soldier. Mr. Rick Fort, who was the chairman of the combined boards of Beauvoir, was doing some metal detecting in some private property in the Vicksburg campaign. He got a ping. He dug down about 18 inches and found the bones of a soldier. He was identified as Confederate by the buttons in his jacket and the accoutrements buried in and around him. In 1979, after an age determination on our soldier by the molars in his mouth, he was 16 years old. They laid him to rest here on the Beauvoir property. They buried him in a simple pine box and they buried him with his canteen. Then in 1981, with the help of the SCV, the UDC, and the CSC, he was given the distinction of being the unknown Confederate soldier for the Confederate States of America, and they placed a marble tomb over him. What that means to us is that he is here to represent all unknown Confederate soldiers who are still buried throughout the North and South in mass and unmarked graves. Then in 1983, he was awarded the Confederate Congressional Medal of Honor. Then in 2019, the Independent Order of Oddfellows. That is the organization that does the pilgrimage to the unknown soldier in Arlington, Virginia, that actually do a pilgrimage here to our unknown Confederate soldier. They awarded him the highest honor that this organization can bestow upon anyone, and that is the Grand Declaration of Chivalry. To this date, he is the only unknown Confederate soldier in the world to receive a pilgrimage, and he is the only unknown Confederate soldier in the world to have the Grand Declaration of Chivalry. There are 784 graves. Like I mentioned earlier, four are people who did not live here when it was a Confederate veterans home. Out of that 780, 529 are actual Confederate veterans. We have a veteran in our cemetery to represent every state that seceded from the Union. The rest are wives and widows. Now, not only do we have Civil War history in our cemetery, we also have some local history for the towns that are here along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We have Eva McDaniels buried in our cemetery. She was one of the first women in the state of Mississippi to own property without the permission of her husband. She was also the first woman to open her own photography shop here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and have pictures of Beauvoir published publicly. We also have Prentice Ingram buried here in our cemetery. Prentice Ingram wrote short stories like Louis Lamar Westerns and he actually wrote the script for the Wild Wild Bill show. And then we have another little irony of history. He went to school with John Wilkes Booth. We also have Mr. and Mrs. Witten buried here in our cemetery. Mr. Witten was the first mayor of Long Beach, Mississippi, which is a town two towns over from Biloxi. Then we have Marianne Kane Fowler. I like to call her the Liz Taylor of the Civil War. She was married eight times. Six of her husbands were Confederate veterans, and she was receiving the $7 a month pension from each of her veteran husbands. She actually married her last two husbands here on the Beauvoir property. The last veteran she buried was Mr. Fuller. Uh, when they were married, Miss Marianne was 89. Mr. Fuller was 79, and their best man was 104. 
so you can imagine it was quite the social event here on the coast. The local newspaper reporter came here and did an article on the whole ceremony and the occasion. He interviewed Miss Fuller and he asked her, Miss Fuller, why have you married so many times? And her comment to him simply was, as long as the good Lord keeps taking them, so will I. <laughs>